Hate is terrible. Hate is terrible. And Jerry was a country boy, and he hated one thing about being a country boy. The outhouse. Yes. Hot in the summer, cold in the winter, and it smelled terrible. He hated that outhouse. So he had an idea. I'm going to go out there, it's right by the bayou, and I'm going to rock it, and I'm going to push it right in the bayou. That's what he did. Chris Splash comes home that evening. Daddy meets him at the door. In Daddy's hand is his belt. Yep, he knew what was coming. I know you did it. You pushed that outhouse into the bayou. Yes, Father, I did. I hated that outhouse. I did it. I'm telling the truth. And he pulls out his belt and gets ready. But Daddy, I told you the truth. Daddy, don't you remember George Washington chopped down a cherry tree? And his daddy accused him of it, and he said, yes, daddy, and he told the truth, and he wasn't punished. And daddy said, yeah, but his father wasn't sitting in the cherry tree. <laughs> <laughs> Hatred is terrible. And it's easy to hate. Over and over again, we will see it this day, perhaps in the days ahead, as the planes crash into the World Trade Center towers, the Pentagon, and that field in Pennsylvania, not too far from Pittsburgh. Easy to hate. Jeremiah had reason to hate in the Old Testament way back, 700 years before Christ. He had spent 40 years preaching, teaching, begging, pleading, shaming, doing all that he could to get his nation to come back to God, and they would not, and were God's people. Jeremiah didn't hate but he wept. The book in your Bible called Lamentations. We get the word lament. To mourn. To be sad. To weep. To cry. It's a picture of Jeremiah sitting outside of Jerusalem. As the Babylonians carry his people into slavery. The nation is destroyed, the temple is destroyed, the city is destroyed, all is over, and it was all for naught, even though he tried for 40 years to correct his people, they wouldn't listen to him, they laughed at him, they mocked him. Now he sits outside of Jerusalem as the captives are marched away, and he weeps. And so we have the book of Lamentations, right after the book of Jeremiah. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 19 and following, he says, Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it. It is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind. And therefore I have hope. The stead fast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never shall come to end. They are new every morning. Great is 
your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. On the 6th, uh, on the 20th of September, 15 years ago, we woke up to a new day. A day of frightening, of terror, of fear. But when you know God as your Savior and you trust in Him, you can wake up on the 20th of September with still new hope as every morning we can wake up with new hope, new belief, new trust. No matter what you're going through, no matter how bad your day is or your nighttime is, you can wake up in the morning knowing that his faithfulness is there, his mercies are there, and they're new, brand new every morning. Did you wake up this morning knowing that his blessing was upon you and trust him? We must not be haters of those who do wrong. It's in your bulletin. I'm not going to go through the whole story. It's there. There are those who decry it, who debunk it, who do not believe it, who mock it, who jeer at it. But it is documented that far beneath the rubble of the World Trade Center, five months after its fall, was found that twisted metal beam upon which was fused Holy Bible. And the page that is open is not an accident. It is not an accident that God planted that there. It is open to the teachings of Jesus in Matthew 7, where he says, no retaliation, no eye for eye, Ear for ear, nose for nose, mouth for mouth, head for head, no retaliation. But forgiveness, love, and forgiveness. <coughs> and that story in Matthew chapter 5 ends with the story of a great fall of a house. When the floods came and the winds blew, great was the fall of that house, as great as the fall of the towers in New York City or the walls of the Pentagon or the tails and the wings of a flight in Pennsylvania. Easy to hate, but we must guard against hatred and realize that God gives to us such blessing. We can be careful. We can be safe, we can be sure, we can be on guard, but it doesn't mean we hate. The greatest danger to our country, the greatest danger to ourselves is not from without, it's the danger from within. When we allow hatred, when we allow sin, it becomes self-destruction. We cannot complain because of our sins that God is punishing us. Any more than little Jerry could complain about his father punishing him for pushing the outhouse over. For in this same book of Lamentations, the third chapter, the 39th verse tells to us, why should a living man complains, a man, about the punishment of his sin. I deserve the wrath of God. I deserve the punishment of God. I deserve the terror of God. I deserve that because I am a sinner. There is none of us standing or sitting here this day that can say we're free of that. And we can't complain. When God's judgment comes upon us. Our nation cannot complain when God's judgment falls upon us. We can only cry out, help us, forgive us, give us new life, new hope, 
a new beginning. You see, my sin is the epicenter of my own misery. My sin brings about my own personal ground zero. And there's nothing but destruction in my life without Christ. There's no future, there's no hope there, but in Christ there is forgiveness. And there is new life. Stanley Pramath was a banker, an investment banker. His office was on the 81st floor of the World Trade Center. Busy with his desk and his figures and his accounts, he rested his eyes by looking out the window. And lo and behold, coming right straight toward his window, looming larger and larger, a 747 came smashing, crashing into that window on the 30, 91st floor. A ball of fire. Smoke, destruction, crumbling walls surrounded him, darkness. He crawls and he gropes and he comes up against a wall that he cannot get through and he pushes on it and shoves on it and makes a fist and drives through that wall. Opens a little opening. Stanley Brayman was going to die that day. But Brian Clark, a Christian on the other side, began to pull him and pulled him through that opening. And unbelievingly, together, Stanley Brayman and Brian Clark begin to descend from the 81st floor all the way down to the ground. And as they stagger away from that burning, smoking, dying tower, the tower begins to fall. Stanley went out of his mind temporarily, as would you, as would I. He got to the hospital and he got his minor, minor wounds taken care of. He went to home. He could not recognize his own family. He couldn't function. He began to pass out from time to time. His life was in shambles just like the tower was. And in his misery and his loneliness, with the stress still upon him, he hears on the radio about 9-11. And he asked for a Bible. And he opens the Bible to Psalm 9 1, verse 1. 9 1 colon 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. He read on, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. 
You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks our darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. When he calls to me, I will answer him, says the Lord. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And by the time he had finished reading the 91st Psalm, Stanley Brainheath had a calmness go over him. He could now recognize his family and speak to them. He could talk intelligently and calmly about the events of that terrible September the 19th. And he said, if God, if God, you get me through this, I'll serve you. And he followed through. And he began to serve God. And he had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of speaking engagements, schools, churches, even homeland security conferences. And he became a preacher in the Assembly of God denomination. And to this day, he's still telling people about God and how God can be found. It's not hatred, but it's love. God can be found by you, by me, right now. The 91st Psalm, the first verse, 911. That's no accident. God uses him and God will use you if you give him your life. You make that commitment and make it now, today, right where you are, where you sit, where you stand, in your heart or publicly. But give your life to him and he has already given his life for you. Maybe stand.